so much for listening to this podcast. I'm Renny, and I am your host for this podcast. I'm super excited for you all to be listening. I'm even grateful that you decided to listen to this very first episode. And you may be listening in 2022, or you may be listening to this in 2025. But whenever you are listening to this, just know that I'm grateful for you for taking a chance and listening to this podcast. If, as you can tell by the title, the podcast is Don't Go Broke Trying. And I wanted to take this opportunity to introduce myself, tell you what to expect from this podcast, the format of this podcast, tell you a little bit about me and how I got started in this personal finance game, and basically explain to you why you should listen to this podcast, because there are lots of finance podcasts out there. But I'm going to tell you why you should listen to this one over all of them. So let's get into this episode. So just an overview of me as a creator and a person. As I said, my name is Rennie. Some people call me Rennie the Resource. Some people call me XO Rennie. Whatever you want to call me out of those three, you can call me. And I am a full-time content creator. So my whole job is to create content. And I started this in 2020 when the pandemic hit. And, you know, there was a lot of extra free time that I had on my hands. So I was like, let me start a YouTube channel. And I started that YouTube channel. The focus of my channel was on what the focus on my channel is on financial literacy, career development and lifestyle. And I really enjoy it. I quit my job in October of 2021 to pursue this full time and it's going really well for me. And I will probably do episodes on that and how I financially prepared to quit my job and things like that. But yeah, I have been a full-time content creator for six months at this point and it is going super duper well. But I started this to help other people and to basically be a resource to others and share knowledge that I currently have because I was very privileged to have an upbringing and I'll talk, get into that later, but I have an upbringing where my parents taught me about financial literacy at a very young age, but I felt like a lot of my counterparts, a lot of my friends did not have that same upbringing. I thought everyone was raised financially literate until I spoke to my friends and then I was like, wait, you guys don't know about investing? You guys don't know about credit cards? What? So... I decided, okay, if my friends don't know, I'm sure many other people don't know. So let me just turn this into a YouTube channel. And now we have a podcast. And the reason that I started the podcast again was because I wanted to talk about personal finance specifically. I make videos again about those three topics and people were like, okay, we love the career, we love the lifestyle, but finance is what we want to talk about. Finance is what we want to talk about. And YouTube videos are very hard to make, actually. Like, they're <laughs> very time-consuming because you're doing both video and audio, you know? Um, but podcasts, I felt, would be an easier way to do it. And I also have a partner for this episode. So Lemonade Finance is partnering and uh, sponsoring my podcast. Thank you so much to them. So I was like, okay, this is the perfect time to start my podcast and start creating content specifically about personal finance. So if you're listening and you're one of those people who only watch my YouTube channel for the personal finance content, I want to make sure you hit that like or not like button on there's no podcast like buttons on podcasts, but make sure you hit that subscribe button to the podcast or follow button if you're on Spotify and make sure you give this podcast five star review because it does help me and it will help more people see this content but I would get a lot of dms even to this day I get a lot of dms about personal finance and people saying hey I'm going through xyz what is your advice in this situation and I'm not a financial advisor but I would always tell them what I would do in that situation and I got them over and over and over again. And I was like, this is good content. I should just answer these questions on a podcast. So again, that's why Don't Go Broke Trying was born. And essentially the premise of the podcast is that I don't want any of you to go broke trying to do X, Y, Z. So we are going to teach you how not to go broke doing whatever you're trying to do right now. And this is one thing that's especially close to my heart is new immigrants. Most people I know moved here very like maybe in their teens or in their I don't know, their early 20s. So they had to learn a completely new financial system. And that can be really hard. And there's no, really no guidance. They don't teach us in school about this. So I wanted to be that person who could basically bridge that gap. So that's what we're going to talk about on this podcast. And I did not want it to be just another boring finance podcast because there are a lot of personal finance podcasts, but some of them are just so boring and they don't appeal to me as a person. I learn stuff, but I don't actually want to listen to a lot of them. So I don't, I really don't consume many personal finance podcasts. So this is going to be a chill, cool, cool podcast where we just answer questions 
uh, talk about different things that we've learned and stuff like that. So the way that this is going to go is I'll, there'll be two form, forms of episodes. The first one will be a podcast episode where we have conversations with people. So all of my favorite podcasts are podcasts where the interviewer is interviewing different people, getting their advice, learning about their story. I listen to podcasts like the Naked Beauty podcast, the Diary of a CEO, How I Built This by Guy Raz, Clever Girl Finance. And the one thing about all of those podcasts is they are interviewing people and learning their stories. So it's not just someone speaking solo, although I'm solo on this episode, I know, but like it's not just someone speaking solo about their experiences. They're also, they're also, um, what's it called? They're also interviewing people that they find inspirational and that we can learn from and the reason that I think it's so important to do this especially in this personal finance space is you learn a lot from people and it allows you not to make the same mistakes that they made and basically save a lot of money like it's one thing to go through and make mistakes with credit cards because you didn't know but that's a very costly mistake right I'm trying to help you to avoid costly mistakes by hearing from someone who has already made the mistake so you don't have to do the same thing and of course it'll be educational so we'll give you some takeaways at the end so for example I'm going to interview one of my friends who actually moved to Canada as an international student and then she did she got a credit card and she didn't know like it wasn't free money so she used it as if it was free money so <laughs> that episode will be about uh, the episode would be don't go broke trying to get a credit card you know so there are a lot of great conversations that I have I have a huge list of people who I'm going to be collaborating with and I'm super excited for those episodes if you have ideas of people that you want me to interview on the podcast make sure to follow us on instagram at don't go broke trying and you can just dm us or email us at dgbt at rennytheresource.com and let us know what type of guests you want to see if you have a specific person you want to interview let me know and I'll make sure to try and get them on another type the other types of episodes that you'll see is me and my guests answering dilemmas so again a lot of the podcasts that I follow are podcasts where the host and a guest typically will answer a dilemma so if you look at the podcast I said what I said the receipts podcast two hot takes to my sisters these are all podcasts where people in their audience will submit questions and then those people the hosts will answer the questions and I love these podcasts because I love hearing people's takes on different situations so we're gonna have an episode like that so these will alternate bi-weekly and every other week you'll hear me and my guests or just me sometimes answering dilemmas my first episode will be my dad and he will tell us his life story of how he became financially literate and I was able to teach his kids to be financially literate but then we will also answer some dilemmas that people have so those will be two separate episodes and I can't wait for you to listen to it and the episodes will either be taken from reddit so I love reddit the 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 subreddits like personal finance Canada like personal finance like investing all of those subreddits I am I the asshole I love reading all of them so I, I always have advice or my own take to give to those people. So I'm like, why don't I just do this on a podcast? So that's what we're going to do. And again, it's going to be chill, easy vibes. You know, we're not trying to, we're not trying to make finance, personal finance too complex and complicated. It's trying to be easy and yeah, easy going. The other types of questions that we'll be finding aside from Reddit are the ones that I get in my DMs. So I get them in my DMs a lot. I cannot physically answer all of them. So what I've been doing is actually emailing. Uh, I created an email, dgbt at rennytheresource.com. And you can email that email and send in your questions there. So yeah. So now that we know a little bit more about this podcast, let me tell you about me and my financial literacy journey and why I am qualified. I don't know <laughs> if that's the word, but why you may want to listen to me and hear from me about my experiences and the things that I've learned and um, why you want to listen to this podcast, essentially. So we are going to. So let me backtrack to the very beginning. Uh, by the way, I'm 25 years old right now. I am a black woman. If you're not watching this on YouTube, I'm a black woman. I live in the greater Toronto area in Canada. And yeah, I'm Nigerian by heritage. I was a marketer. And well, I still am a marketer. I was working corporate Canada, not corporate America. I was working corporate Canada. And now I work for myself as a full time content creator, as I mentioned. So that's just a little backstory about me. And we don't see many women 
in the personal finance space. We also don't see many black women in the personal finance space. So I feel like I occupy a very niche space and I'm very grateful to have an audience that can relate to me. The majority of my audience are black women and I appreciate you. I see you. I thank you for listening to me. And yeah, let me get back into my story of how I grew up and my financial literacy journey and how I got to where I am today. So if we take it very back, all the way back to the beginning, I grew up in England. I grew up in, in, or I, no, I didn't grow up there. I was born in London, England in, yeah, 1996, a long time ago. (laughs) My sister always calls me old, but she's, she's born in 1999. So we're basically the same age, but I was born in 1996 in London, England. I lived there for a few years and then My parents moved us over to Canada, and I've been living in Ontario, Canada, ever since. So I, when I was four years old, I moved here, and I remember my dad taking me to the bank, and my dad was like, we're opening a bank account for you. I don't know how I remember this. Maybe it was like a little traumatic for me, (laughs) Uh, even though it's not that, it's not actually a scary thing or anything like that but it's something that I will never forget and my dad took me to the bank and said okay Renny and my sister as well and he was like let's open you a bank account and I was like okay and he explained what a bank account was and I was like okay interesting um and I kept asking a lot of questions because you know kids at that age they ask bare questions so I was asking him like dad why do I need a bank account and he would say this is where you put your money and if you put your money, the bank's going to pay you a little bit of money to have your money here. And I was like, okay, cool. And then I said, so anytime I, so how do I get my money back? And he explained that, okay, you have this card, mommy and daddy will hold it for you, but we have this card and this card will allow you to go to a machine and take out your money. And I was like, okay, cool, cool. That was, that, well, that was good for me. And then I asked him, but how do I know that my money is going to come out? Like, how do I know that the money that you that I put in is the same money that's going to come out and my dad was like you don't know like you're the bank's loaning he he was using big words at the time I don't think I fully understood it but he was like you the bank loans out your money to other people and that was when I lost it I started crying and I was like I don't want to put my money in a bank because I don't want the bank to loan my money to other people honestly to this day I kind of have the same views like the bank shouldn't really be um loaning my money out to other people at a high interest rate but it is what it is that's how the world works but that is my very first memory of money and I remember that every time that my dad would ask for my uh Every time, like, you know, I'm Nigerian, so aunties and uncles, I'm sure other cultures do this, but aunties and uncles would, like, come over to our house, and, you know, instead of, like, sometimes they stay at your house for a week or whatever, and then they'd always give money to your, to you instead of your parents, and I know that most parents would take that money from their kids, and they'd be like, oh, I'll hold it for you, (laughs) and I'm sure many of you have experienced that if you are, well, no matter what culture, I'm sure many of you have experienced that your parents are like, I will hold that money for you, I will hold it for you, and then you never see it again, right, but I had a different experience where my dad was like, okay, now you got $50 from this person, $25 has to go into the bank account that you have, and it was just a constant thing. Every time that I got money, my dad was teaching me half of it has to go into your bank account. Half of it has to go into your bank account. Half of it has to go into your bank account. And it just became a habit. So over the years from age four till whatever, whatever age I got a job, which I think was about 15 or 16, I got a job and my dad was like, half of it has to go into your bank account. And I was like, Ugh, okay. But I guess by that time I was used to it. So I wasn't getting much money. Say I'm getting $50 a month or something. Now I'm getting... I was working at a basketball, a a basketball league, and they would actually pay me in cash. Should I be admitting this online? I don't know. (laughs) But I was making some good money, let's say. And I was, yeah, I was making, (laughs) hmm, I was making some good money. And with that money, I was able to, I would say I would make 400 a weekend or 300 a weekend. Again, my dad would say, please put that money away and put it in your bank account and we move. So again, I got very used to doing that. I would put half in my bank account and the other half would be for me to spend. 
Then when I turned 18, my dad was like, okay, Rennie, we need to talk about credit cards. You're about to go over to university because my birthday's in July. I was going to university in August, uh, in September. My dad was like, you're about to go into university. We need to teach you about credit cards. And my dad walked through and explained what a credit card is, how it works, and all that jazz to me. And at the time, it was kind of like, okay, he, he basically emphasized that a credit card is not your money. It is not your money at all. This is money that that it's debt it's interest free it's an interest free loan for the 21 day period or however long the period is but it is not free money don't see it as free money and that served me so well when I went to university I was able to like a lot of my friends were offered credit cards we're all offered credit cards they literally have booths each of the banks would have booths on our on our campus and the booth would be for a free they would say we'll give you a free ipad if you sign up for a credit card we'll give you a free this if you sign up for a credit card we'll give you a free that if you sign up for a credit card so of course most people are going to sign up like i i signed up as well but the difference between me and most of my peers is that i knew that even though i sign up that doesn't mean i have to use it in an irresponsible way because no one teaches you how to use it right so i was using it in a way that it's like like I was using it as a, like a debit card. I would spend money on my credit card, but only as much money as I had in cash in my checking account. So that's one thing that I guess is very formative on this personal finance journey of mine. So I went through life, <laughs> wow, very deep. I went through university and I basically was very financially literate. I was working at a shoe store during my university time. So I was working like 30 hours a week maybe, 20 hours to 30 hours a week I would work and again half of that money started going into uh, half of that money was in uh, put into my savings account and then again I was 18 my dad said so Rennie it's time to start investing in the stock market and I was like oh my goodness okay <laughs> what is this guy on about now but he was like yes it's time for you to start investing in the stock market so I was like, okay, dad, let's do it. You know, let's do it. So he showed me, he taught me about the concept of not just, not just working for money, but allowing your money to work for you. And that was one of the most valuable gifts that I could ever have been taught. And to be taught it at such a young age is such a blessing. I don't take it for granted. Like, it's something that I, I'm very appreciative that I learned at such a young age. So one thing my dad always says is, it's your job to make money. So it's your job to go work that nine to five, work that part time job, work whatever you're doing and make money. But it's your money's job to make you more money. And that was like poof, mind blowing, literally mind blowing. <laughs> so that's what I did. I went out and I made my money. I made my money and then I started making my money work for me and I did that through the form of investing in the stock market because it's one of the easiest ways to get to start making your money work for you of course you could do real estate but that is like a much bigger a much bigger investment whereas with investing especially now in 2022 you can invest with just one dollar and start with one dollar back then you couldn't when I started but again I, I, you're able to start with, say, a few hundred dollars or fifty dollars, whatever it is. So, I opened my account, my direct investing account. I opened my tax-free savings account, and I was like, "Let's get it!" So, I, re I start. I am. I was not a risk taker at the time. So I was like, "Okay, Dad, what are the safest stocks possible?" My dad was like, "The banks," and I was like, "Okay, cool. The banks, it is." So I started investing in the banks and. Let's see. I started investing in the banks like this is not financial advice, by the way, but I started investing in the banks like BMO, like TD. And I think that's it. BMO and TD are the banks that I was investing in. And I saw growth over time. And of course, with the banks, it's they're very stable companies. So it was very slow growth, but it was still growth. And I was happy. I was like, oh, like I could never get this amount of money in my savings account. So I was extremely happy that, okay, at least like I'm getting something, you know? So I put my money in the savings account. I mean, I put my money in the stocks and I saw growth. So after that, after a few years getting comfortable with that, I was like, okay, I'm ready for more, you know, more, more, what's, I don't even know what the word is, but basically stocks that would make me more money. So I started working on that and to do that, I, st I asked my dad, basically, 
I, can, I don't, I wouldn't say I have a story where it's like, oh, I researched this and I researched this and I did this and I did, no, I didn't have that kind of story, unfortunately. I had a story, well, not unfortunately, very fortunately, <laughs> uh, I was just able to rely on my dad because my dad had a lot of the knowledge already. So my dad was investing in tech, a lot of tech companies, Microsoft, you know, all these, all these big tech companies. And he reads The Motley Fool. And he'll talk about this in our next episode about how he got financially literate and different things like that. But he read The Motley Fool. And in The Motley Fool, they were talking about this company called Shopify and how it's the next big thing. It's going to uh, revolutionize e-commerce and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, okay, <laughs> whatever you say, dad, let me put my money in this stock, whatever you say. So every two weeks, I was making $9 an hour at the time working at the shoe store, and I would just put in a little bit of money. Every two weeks, I would put in a little bit of money into these stocks, and it was like $200, $250, whatever could buy a stock. It was literally like me buying one stock at a time because, again, I could not, I didn't have that much disposable income where I could buy a lot, but I could buy that one or two stocks, so I would buy one stock, two stocks. This is back when Shopify was like very much cheaper than it is now. So that's what I was doing. And by, th so I kept doing that religiously. And by the time I was 23 years old, so I had graduated university. I had, okay, no, let me go back. When I was in university, I started an internship in my second year of university. So I was doing the internship plus working at the shoe store and I was making so much more money. So again, 50% of that I would put in Shopify. So, uh, so during the summers, I was able to put maybe $500 every two weeks or so sometimes a thousand dollars every two weeks into Shopify simply because again I was working at I was making way more money when I was working at the bank during my internship so by the time I graduated and I was working for two years I think or one and one year and a half and then my dad's like so Renny how's your portfolio doing and I was like what do you mean um it's doing good I don't know and my dad was like how's it like what I, how much money do you have? Is it going well? Blah, blah, blah. And I was like, yeah, it's going well. I'm a very lazy investor, by the way. We can do a whole episode about this. But I just check my portfolio every two weeks. So my dad was like, show me your portfolio. And I was like, oh, okay. I showed him my portfolio and I had $60,000 in my portfolio. Maybe sixty five, dollars something along those lines. And my dad was like, oh, so this girl has money. Okay, you're buying a house. And I was like, dad, please <laughs> stop stressing me. I'm not trying to buy a house. And my dad was like, yeah, you're buying a house. So that's a whole nother story. And if you want me to do an episode about how I actually purchased my first house and the mortgage and all that stuff, I can do that. But essentially, I bought my first house at the age of 23. When I was 22, I hired a realtor. I put down a deposit for my, and he found me a pre-construction. I put down a deposit on this pre-construction property. And then one year later, the prop property closed and it was, um, one year later, property closed, and it was in 2020. So the world had shut down, essentially, but my property had closed. I bought it at a good time. So that property was $349,000, but again, in Canada, you put down 20%. So I put, about, I put down around 70000 at that time. And then I closed on my property, and right now that property is worth about 200, I mean, whoa. <laughs> right now that property is worth about $780,000. So I bought it in 20, I put the deposit down in 2019, I closed it in 2020, and in 2022 it's 780K. So I bought it at a very good time, one of the best investments again. And again, I have to credit my dad because if it wasn't for him, I wouldn't have bought anything. I would have just had that money sitting in my account. And the reason I was able to do that again is because I was constantly investing from the age of 20 or of since 18 and Shopify was about 1000 something dollars by the time I sold it. So imagine I bought each stock for $200. I well 200 to say $400 because I bought it over a span of years as it was growing. But I was dollar cost averaging every two weeks buying Shopify stocks, buying Shopify stocks, buying Shopify stocks. Two weeks uh two three or five years later, no, I don't know the timeline, but a few years later I was 23 years old and I had 60 something thousand dollars in my account and I was able to purchase my house because the, so the stocks had grown to 1000 plus dollars per stock. $200 to $1000 per stock. Huge gain and I couldn't have done it. I could not have made that money in anywhere, I don't think. Maybe crypto, but <laughs> other than that, like the stock um 
or yeah, it's hard to make that money elsewhere. So I'm very glad that I put my money into Shopify at that time and it bought me my first house. Once I did that, that's when I started my YouTube channel and I decided to teach other people about how I got to the place that I was and the YouTube channel started to take off. So I was making, I don't know, 60 something thousand at my job uh, working in marketing and I was working in the wealth management department of a big bank here in Canada. I was making around 60,000, some $63,000 I think at that time and I was doing well. I was thriving. I was able to balance both my YouTube channel and I was able to balance my, what's it called? My YouTube channel and my workload. It was fine. In December of 2020, I believe, yeah, I got a promotion and that's when everything went downhill. <laughs> I, I oh gosh, this is like, just thinking about it, it like brings up bad memories and I actually met with one of my coworkers today and we were talking about it but I was going through a lot we were both burnt my coworker and I we were both burnt out we were stressed a lot was going on I, I'm yeah let me not I'm not gonna go into it right now but I was no longer able to balance my workload and YouTube so although I was posting and although things seemed like it was good, I mentally was not doing well. So I decided to save up enough money to leave my job. And then I quit on October 1st, 2021. I left that job. And the reason that I was able to leave was because I had multiple streams of income. And I will do a whole video, actually. I just, I'm going to record that actually right away. But I... Yeah, I'm going to record that now, actually. So I have multiple streams of income and I am able to have those streams of income because I have made my money work for me, as my dad has always reiterated throughout my whole life. So I had my stock, my investing portfolio, the dividends that come from my investing portfolio, my real estate, because I rent out that property to other tenants. So the money it's cash flow positive, meaning that every month after I pay my mortgage, there's still money left over. And that's some extra money that I can live off of. I also have my um, YouTube channel that was making quite a bit of money. And I also had speaking engagements. So those were some of the streams of incomes that I had. And I think in June of 20, I wasn't making, I was making about 60 something thousand, right? So that's around like 3000 something a month after taxes. It's not that it's not much if you live in an expensive city like I do. And then one in June of 2021, I made about three thousand dollars on YouTube. And I was like, whoop, it's time. So I was like, oh, I've it's time. It's time to leave. I've made three thousand dollars in one month on YouTube. It is time to leave my job. But again, I didn't leave until October of that year. But now I just had my first five figure month making ten thousand dollars a month. So you know, levels have changed and I'm so glad that I decided to take that leap of faith and actually leave. If you want to, if you want me to do a whole episode on the money that I make from YouTube, we can talk about that because there is money to be made in the YouTube influencing content creator game, but nobody really talks about it. They will yeah, mostly people talk about the trips they get, the free things they get, but there's also like just a lot of money <laughs> to be made. Like I'm wondering how much these big influencers make. I'm a small influencer at this moment. I have about 12,000 followers on YouTube, so it's not like I have a huge channel, but small but mighty, making good money, cannot complain, able to sustain my bougie, not really bougie, but my able to sustain this lifestyle. So that's a little bit about me and my journey. And I am so grateful that I'm able to do this full time and be a resource to others. All I ever wanted to do was, well, when I was a kid, I actually wanted to be a teacher for some time, but I heard teachers don't make less, that much money. So I was like, mm, no, but I can do it. And I know that I can do it because I've been doing it for two years, almost two years now, and it's going really well. So I hope that you are able to take something out of these future episodes that will come. This was just an overview and a background about me so that people who don't know me, who've never watched my YouTube channel, can learn a little bit about me. But if you do know me, you probably already know all this story. But in my next episode, I'm going to have my dad on and he's going to be teaching or telling us about his journey to financial literacy and how he went from nothing to being financially literate and make yeah building a huge portfolio that's 
he then taught his daughters to do the same. So I am very excited for you all to be listening to my podcast. Again, if you share the episodes, it really does help. If you like these episodes, share it with a friend because it helps me get noticed. And I'm really passionate about teaching people about these topics. So hopefully we can reach a lot of people through this podcast. I also like podcasts because I find that it's easier to do long form content than it is on YouTube. With YouTube, if you're watching a YouTube video on your phone, you can't be on any other app. All your attention has to be on your phone. Whereas with a podcast, you can be listening to it in the background and be on Instagram at the same time, can be working out at the same time. You can do whatever you want. And that's what I really like about podcasts. So these may be a little bit long form episodes, like maybe 30, 40, 50 hour long episodes sometimes. But I'm really excited to bring you the people that or bring you lots of people that have made great money and have made mistakes and want basically to help you avoid making those mistakes so you don't go broke. On this podcast, again, uh, I'm excited to be talking to you and bringing you lots of guests so you don't make the same mistakes they did and so that you can avoid going broke. I do have an issue with saying the word broke. I have to say it very slowly if I want to get that R out. Sometimes you may hear broke woke (laughs) so if you hear that just ignore it you know it is what it is um and i was also want to say thank you to ala for creating the name of this podcast because she came up with it my sister and her friends had a brainstorming session and came up with this podcast name so shout out ala because i really love the podcast name shout out emily for designing my cover art shout out pascal for editing my podcast and producing my podcast shout out wonder girl for the music honestly shout out to all of you and shout out lemonade finance for sponsoring this because i couldn't have done it without you so thank you all for listening if you got this far make sure to like rate review whatever all that jazz i'm excited i'm super excited to bring you these next few episodes I have great guests in mind and they're gonna blow your mind you're gonna learn a lot so I can't wait for you to listen thank you so much for listening and I hope to see you or hope you can listen to the next episode I'll see you in the next one bye